Thank you, Philip, for that enlightening introduction. The reason why one moves from one place is to move to a better place, or at least somewhere where you've got new challenges and new things in life to do. Uh, and so that's why I moved to Finland. But to get on with talks, which I'm here for, um, when uh, the university advertised the uh, title of our talks a couple of weeks ago, uh, mine was Visualizing Time, and a friend of mine from New Zealand wrote back and said, oh, I wish I could be there. Um, not so much because she's interested in listening to me, but because the title of my talk was so intriguing. And I thought, well, at least I've done something right. By choosing two words commonly used in our everyday life, visualizing and time, I've created a title that is at least intriguing. So why is it intriguing? Well, let's start looking at why the, the, the word visualize. And the quote that I've chosen to kind of talk about visualize comes from uh, a book, another good friend of mine, Bob Spence, who wrote on uh, information visualization a few year, years ago, a very successful book. In that, he defines visualization or visualize as to form a mental model or mental image of something um, in presumably in our minds. And the reason I like this uh, kind of definition is because it has got nothing to do or doesn't say anything about seeing or vision, right? So we can visualize stuff without ever seeing them, or in fact, visualize things that have no physical representation. Okay, so that word itself is intriguing. The next word is even more intriguing than the first one, time. Again, I've chosen a quote that I really like, and this comes from another information visualization book, but the actual uh, quote is from St. Augustine in his um, uh, book, The Confession, around 400 AD. He writes, describes time as, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain to it to him who asks, I do not know. So all of us know what time is, well, concept of time is, but as soon as we start describing it to others, it becomes intriguing. What is really time? But of course, for those of us who visualize time, as you'll see, we have to visualize time somehow, and it is possible. So visualizing time, in a way, is about visualizing something which is indescribable and perhaps something that we can't see. Actually, we can't see time or sense it with any of our normal senses, but it is yet around us and we know what it is. So how do we visualize this concept, this thing? Let's, let's try a simple experiment. Close your eyes for a couple of seconds and try to visualize time for yourself. Right? Try to imagine progression of time, try to imagine the things that happen across time, and try to draw time somehow in your mind. Ready? All right. I can pretty much guarantee that some of you visualize time as somehow a line, perhaps gave it a direction probably going towards the future. Some of you may have visualized time in a circular manner, possibly because we are used to clocks that goes around and around in clockwise manner. Again, give it a direction. Those of you who are a little bit more adventurous may have even visualized time as something that splits and progresses in parallel universes, parallel times, somehow. And this kind of linking time to line is so natural to all of us that we somehow think that they both go together. In reality, that's not really the case. There aren't many ancient visualizations of time that link somehow to lines. In fact, one of the only early examples of linking time somehow to uh, lines is this one from around 11th uh, 10th, 11th century, as a side note to a book that is describing the movement of planets, all right, which is reported in the book by uh, somebody in the 1940s. The more kind of recent 
linkage between time and line is actually fairly recent. Well, fairly recent in terms of human history. It starts around the end or second half of the uh, 18th century, where people like uh, Priestley, in his book describing the life of famous people from about 1200 BC to about 1800 AD, his own time, uh, uh, using timelines, right? Another uh, example or series of ex examples come from Playfair, uh, who is well known to those who are interested in visualization. He created all sorts of visualizations that we use 200 la years later, pie charts, bar charts, line charts, all sorts of things. And one of the things that he was interested in was showing things like trade, you know, poverty, that sort of stuff. And to be able to do that kind of things, he needed to represent those across time. So he's, uh, he started using lines. Of course, I'll never ever pretty much give a talk on information visualization or visualization without referring to Minard's uh, uh, visualization of um, uh, conquest of French or attempt, uh, French army's attempt of conquest of Russia in 1812-1830, the miserable defeat of Napoleon's forces, not only showing time but also some information going from troop numbers to temperature and so on, uh, as well as geographical locations uh, for a period of two years, and this has been referred to as the most beautiful visualization ever created, and I don't disagree with that, that claim. So. Relationship between time and line somehow starts about 200 years ago, but as I said, it's become a natural way of how we visualize time. My own love affair, if you like to call it, with time or visualization of time started about 1995, living in a place that uh, Philip will call paradise, and it is. But one of the problems with living in paradise is so far away from everywhere else. So as a student, I wanted to come to Europe to attend the conference and do a few other things. This was my, going to be my first time in Europe, and so I had packed a lot of things into about three uh, weeks of stay in, 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 um, in Europe. And in those days, I don't know if you remember that far back, uh, the internet was fairly limited. There weren't any services as such. And uh, even email wasn't being used that much. So I called my travel agent. And after many discussions over the phone and few visits to, uh, to her office, uh, she sent or well, posted, actually, my uh, itinerary to me in the old traditional tabular form. I don't know if it was the excitement of the time or what. I looked at this itinerary and I uh, looked at when I was leaving New Zealand and I looked at when I was arriving in Los Angeles and I thought that she made a terrible mistake because I was arriving there a day earlier. Of course, those of us who are not that excited about traveling to Europe will realize, OK, as you uh, fly from New Zealand to uh, Los Angeles, you cross the date line and you go uh, one day back in time. Regardless of that, as I started my travel through Europe, I discovered that, okay, uh, there are all sorts of things that I need to do. There are different places I have to visit. I have to call people at home and so on. And this whole concept of time or time zones and all kinds of things that were happening across time became rather confusing to me. But I was doing my PhD at the time, and I couldn't really do much about this problem. But I knew that we could do better than just relying on these tabular itineraries. So a few years later, uh, when I found my permanent job back in New Zealand, I was actually in Europe in between doing my postdoc and so on. I said, I'm going to do something about this problem of time zones. And I went back, and interestingly, while I had been away, uh, my colleagues and my PhD supervisor, Professor Apperley, and his group were actually working on creating visual itineraries. And he, they had created this thing for travel agents as a way of organizing um, travel itineraries more visually. I won't go into the details, and there's really no reason, but it was actually based on Murray's uh, timetable of trains in, uh, in uh, France in the late um, 
and 19th century, uh, looking at how fast travels, uh, trains travel between Paris and Lyon, and basically linking the slope of the lines that you see on the screen to the speed of the trains. If it was a sharp slope, the train was going fast. If it was a long uh, um, slope, then the train was going slow. So it's a fairly good visualization. Anyway, these guys had used this as a, as a, as a way of uh, designing this particular visualization. But at the time, I knew that it's OK for organizing your travel things, but you couldn't carry a PC around uh, while traveling. And I, I knew that somehow we needed to provide a better solution for the actual travelers. Luckily, there was this little company far in the other side of the coal, Finland, that was producing these mobile phones. And the thing interesting about these mobile phones were that beyond sending and receiving text and receiving calls, which was the only thing those days you could do with a mobile phone, they started sending or uh, the ability to receive very simple images, which they called VAP, for the technology they called VAP. So I thought, OK, this is what I'm going to use to be able to create visualizations that you can receive on your phone while you are traveling. My first ever uh, research student that I got, I gave him this task. This is what you need to do. And he created this rather sort of simple ways of looking at travel itineraries vis uh, uh, through visual means, simple lines. And indeed, we ran studies and showed that this was actually quite useful, despite the fact that it was fairly simple. So the second step in that line was when they, these things came along, um, PDAs, or Personal Digital Assistants, and which really became the uh, kind of predecessors of our smartphones. And these things provide a simple screen, but they provided colors and so on. So the second research student that I got, I said, stick to this itinerary stuff because it's interesting. And he created a series of visualization that you could um, you use on your uh, PDA, again, using lines as well as calendar kind of events that you see on those other um, areas. And this work progressed for a while. And I thought, well, these devices are going to become fairly common in the future. So why not develop all sorts of visualizations that you could use on small screen spaces? And so the next thing that I started working on was on how people uh, conduct meetings. And they have recorded meeting content. They have textual meeting contents, documents that they discuss in their meetings and so on. So wouldn't it be nice if I could have my notes on my, on my PDA as well as the recorded audios? And I could move from the recorded audio to text and from text to audio and so on. So we started looking at these kinds of visualization, linking text and uh, audio, uh, possibly video recordings as well, and started doing that. But as soon as you start working on small screens, you start realizing how valuable space is. And one of the problems with timelines, which you see in the first two screens, is that they waste a lot of space, so you need to create more compact visualizations. And we started doing that, and the second or the third uh, visualization appeared, which we called Mosaic. And this led to a whole range of other visualizations that you could develop for ordinary tasks. Gantt charts have been around since the beginning of the 20th century. Very useful, all sorts of people use it. And again, there's a lot of wasted space, particularly if you are trying to schedule a lot of tasks, so it's pretty sparse sort of visualization. Of course, that's not very good use of space. So we developed the mosaic visualization that compacts things, but also allows comparison of time sequences and things like that much easier. Again, we conducted studies, and uh, uh, this was much more useful than uh, the conventional Gantt charts. And this continued for several years. I've got all sorts of visualizations related to that. Then I became interested in other aspects of time. For instance, if I am doing things during the day, I'm more interested in those things during the day, f f like consuming energy. I consume more power during the day, so I'm more interested in knowing about it. Whereas during the nights, I don't use much, so I'm not that interested in that. Most visualizations tend to have this linear view of time, that time sequences are always taking the same amount of space to be represented. 
But in this case, I'm not interested in that. So let's use space non-linearly to show the time when it matters a lot and not show it when it doesn't matter that much. So I developed this uh, time pie with visualization of energy consumption data based on the um, Rose diagram uh, developed again in the um, mid 19th century. And a few years later, uh, we decided that, or a year or so later after development of this particular visualization, we decided that, okay, actually comparison of time much easier in uh, Cartesian form, so we developed a Cartesian version of the circular um, time lap. Now, what's the moral of all this story about all these visualizations, and a lot of others that I've done over the last 20 years or so? including these ones, which is fairly recent, last year. Again, dealing with timelines, this time time being converted to other things like variations and tonal uh, value of colors to show variations in, in this case, energy uh, consumption of energy in terms of the, the load of power that you're actually using. All of them, and this is really my interest, is development of visualizations for ordinary people, people do not, who do not necessarily have the skills and qualifications in analytics. We are not, as data increases in our society, we are not going to be able to depend on creating visualizations just for experts. Everyone is creating data and presumably they're interested in viewing their own data. So my primary purpose is to develop visualizations for ordinary people who can only rely on their perceptual skills and abilities to interpret the kind of visualizations that I'm creating for it. And although this link between visual perception and visualization may seem obvious to most of us, it's in, fi in fact been ignored for a long, long time, and it's about time to change. The reason that's been ignored is that you can kind of visualize visualization itself in a sequence of things from scientific data or people who are interested primarily in data and those who are presented or primarily interested on visual things. And if you think of visual design and people who do infographics, that kind of things, they're primarily interested in layout and colors and uh, display of information in a fancy way so that they attract your, your attention. And sometimes they make mistakes by uh, either misrepresenting data or actually not presenting it in a way that is directly accurately reflecting the data that you are trying to show. And on the other side, you have got scientific people who are really genuinely interested in data itself, and so they rely on the best visualization that they think is suitable for their task, which may not be effective, which may not be actually that useful, and they hardly ever evaluate any of the visualizations that they develop as a means of seeing whether it matches our visual perceptual skills or not, right? And my task, and uh, uh, sort of in this context, is to create visualizations that rely on uh, perceptual skills that we know from visual communication design, as well as our knowledge of scientific fields in which the data is important and needs to be presented uh, effectively. And if you bring those two together, this kind of gives me the reason about why I moved to Alto. Simply because of the fact this is one of those places that you can do exactly this kind of research. If you want to do data visualization, information visualization, any form of visualization, you are inherently working in an interdisciplinary environment, all right? And so you need places which bring arts and sciences together and creates the environment to, for collaboration between those two. And also is the place that has that. We've got a long heritage of scientific and technological um, sort of development, as well as a, a very uh, distinguished area of arts, visual communication design, and design in general. So with that note, I will end my talk. Thank you.